Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Trapped by Love. I'm your host, Emma Carrington. This podcast covers cases of domestic abuse and domestic homicide. So if this is not the kind of content that you were looking for, I completely understand. Thanks for stopping by and checking us out. My aim in covering these cases is to honour the victims of these crimes and to get their stories out there in the hopes of warning others who may find themselves in similar situations. So in saying that, I mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the victims or their loved ones. I have done my very best to thoroughly research these cases and to get the details as accurate as possible. The hope is that the more people who recognise the red flags and warning signs of abusive relationships, the less prevalent these cases will be in the future. Knowledge is power and we need to know what to be on the lookout for so we can protect ourselves and each other. So let's go ahead and get into this week's case. Today's case is that of Mark Harshberger. Mark was born in Lewiston in Pennsylvania on the 11th of October in 1963 to Leonard and Beulah Harshberger. After high school, he entered the US Air Force, serving his country from 81 until 84 as a military police officer. As the years went by, he found his place in the world as a contractor. Mark met Mary Beth Kintner, who was born on the 19th February in 1965 on a job in the year 2000. The pair hit it off and their first date was a fishing trip, only days after they first met. And in a matter of weeks, Mark had left the woman he'd been with for 12 years and had begun a relationship with Mary Beth. They were married a year later on the 23rd of June 2001 and their wedding photos showcased their passion for firearms. There were a number of photos showing Mary Beth shooting in her wedding dress. By all accounts they seemed to be perfectly matched and very much in love. They both had a love of hunting and fishing. Mark lived for the sport and was thrilled to have found a partner who not only enjoyed it but was equally as skilled as he was. Mary Beth had been an avid hunter since she was 12, so it was very much a part of her life. They joined and shot competitively at an exclusive thousand yard club. The couple accrued an extensive collection of precision rifles and high powered scopes. Mary Beth found in her marriage to Mark, what Mark's brother Dean calls a new measure of status. While the marriage worked well at first, by all accounts, it disintegrated after a year or so into chaos. Dean says that Mary Beth had such a terrible temper, she also couldn't stop spending money. Mary Beth had a daughter from a previous relationship, and after Mark and she married, they went on to have two children together. When Mark became a father, he was beyond thrilled. Mary Beth fell pregnant with their second child in 2005, and having to go off her bipolar medication because of the pregnancy hit Mary Beth hard. She ended up having a violent episode that had Mark taking her to a medical centre. The staff there suggested she be admitted to Carbondale, which is a psychiatric facility. Mary Beth didn't want to sign herself in, and Mark was hesitant to do so for her because by Pennsylvania state law, if she was admitted involuntarily, she would lose the right to own or shoot firearms. When this was pointed out to her, she reluctantly agreed to sign herself in. While under the care of doctors at the facility, Mary Beth was placed back on her medication and monitored. While she was there, Mark had a friend come over and he and his friend Bill went through the Harshbarger home to look for and lock up any and all firearms. They found a loaded 12 gauge shotgun under Mary Beth's side of the bed and they also found a handgun hidden under the dresser in the bedroom. By 2006 when their son was born they were building a new home to accommodate their growing family and when the baby was just seven months old the couple planned a hunting trip to Newfoundland in Canada. Mark's father Lee recalls discussing the trip with Mark and expressing concern regarding the cost It was going to be about a $10,000 trip and Lee knew that building their home was taxing on the couple's finances. Mary Beth seemed to alleviate this concern by calling the hunting lodge to arrange a reduced rate because they were going to be taking and staying in their own camper 
where they would also be cooking all their own meals. So in the first weeks of September, the couple packed up their camper and their kids. Then along with Mark's brother, Barry, they made the 2,280 kilometer drive from Mishopen, Pennsylvania to Buckins Junction in New Finland. In the first few days, they had success in their hunts. Mark had even shot a black bear. Then at the end of the final day of their trip, Mark and their hunting guide went into the spruce woods to try and flush out a black bear while Mary Beth and the children stayed back in the tray of the Chevy pickup and Barry was in a blind a few kilometers away. It was 7.55 p.m. when Mary Beth took aim and fired the rifle that her husband had given her for Christmas into the fading light. Then there was a harrowing scream and Mary started yelling, oh my God, I've killed my love, I've killed my love. And she had. With one shot to the abdomen, she had ended Mark's life. But how? When the hunting guide came out of the brush, she explained to him as well as to anyone else she came in contact with from then on that she had thought she was shooting a bear. When authorities, that is the RCMP, arrived, they assumed the shooting was an accident and were sympathetic to Mary Beth. They accepted her explanation that she thought that her husband was a bear. An RCMP officer familiar with the case said, quote, at that point, you can hardly blame the guys for not thinking foul play. I mean, what woman would intentionally shoot her husband in front of her own children? And that's a good question. Mark had been shot at 200 feet. But remember, Mary Beth was a part of that exclusive thousand yard club. And 200 feet is not even close to 70 yards, let alone a thousand. So what had gone wrong? Well, according to the RCMP, nothing. Constable Doug Hewitt and his fellow investigators quickly ruled the death a result of an accident within 36 hours and cleared Mary Beth to leave the country. Free woman. She's remarkably strong, is what Hewitt said at the time. She's holding up very well. Barry, however, not so much. The day after the incident, he told his wife Linda back in Pennsylvania that he was heartsick and wanted nothing more than to get on a plane and come home. But then sometime between his call to Linda and the next day, he changed his mind and decided to drive home with Mary Beth. Things just got stranger once they got back to Pennsylvania. On that first night, Mark's father Lee and his wife Carol came around and Mary Beth offered no apology or explanation to them about what had happened to Mark. Like, how could you not? Carol offered her help to Mary Beth, offering to look after the kids, thinking this would give Mary Beth time to make funeral arrangements or speak with the family. But no, Mary Beth said coldly, yeah, you can mind the kids. We've got all this meat in the cooler that needs butchering. And that's all she said. Then she just went out and started butchering the caribou that she and Mark had shot without even really acknowledging her father-in-law. I mean, what strange behavior. But if you think that's bizarre, get this. The first thing Barry did was tell his wife of 26 years that, quote, things had changed and that he thought they should go their separate ways. Um, what? At first, Linda, his wife, couldn't believe it, thinking it was just the stress or he was not thinking straight. But, nope, he left. And then to add insult to injury, Barry went right over to Mary Beth's and started living with her and the kids. Yeah, so that all happened. Then a day or two later, when Mark's body arrived in Pennsylvania, Mary Beth had it cremated immediately before the family had a chance to view the remains. When Lee, Mark's dad, was finally able to obtain an official registration of death from the chief medical examiner's office in St. John's, he saw that the death was marked a homicide, which, of course, to the family suggested murder. Lee realised that even though the phrasing may be nothing more than standard terminology when someone has been killed by someone else, he suspected that Mary Beth knew it would catch their attention and get them thinking. The shooting was described as an incident also, not an accident, which may have also raised suspicions. But the family already had their suspicions because even though at the beginning of the relationship they'd welcomed Mary Beth into the family with open arms, over the years they'd seen and heard some disturbing things. 
things like the history of violence and mental instability that had been part of her previous relationships. Like she'd once driven a car at speed through the wall of an ex's house. At another time, she'd strangled to unconsciousness a teenage girl who dared to speak to her boyfriend at the time. And then there was the time she put a bullet in the leg of a former boyfriend who she believed had wronged her in their relationship. So with all that they knew about the couple's relationship and what they know of Mary Beth, they started hounding the RCMP to take a closer look at Mark's case. They expressed concerns for a number of reasons. Firstly, Mary Beth was a terrific shot, like scary good. Mark had only just been bragging to his dad about Mary Beth before they'd gone on this trip. He said, quote, Dad, you should see Mary Beth shoot. Boy, she's good. Mark explained to his dad that at 250 yards, his wife could hit a tiny plastic pill bottle no wider than an inch. That's 50 yards further than what she shot him. Lee said he had a lot of problems with Mary Beth. That is, Mark had a lot of problems with Mary Beth, but he loved shooting and he was a crack shot and he was proud that she could shoot too. Mark had confided to his friend Chris Osman that Mary Beth had just weeks earlier drastically increased his life insurance from $150,000 to $550,000 and that he suspected that she would one day line him up in the crosshairs. At least it'll be quick, he had told Osman in reference to the fact that Mary Beth is a deadly marksman, able at a thousand yards to consistently put 10 straight rounds into a three inch group. He joked that he was worth more to her dead than alive. But these issues were not just a recent problem for the pair. Dean, Mark's brother, had at Mark's request once lived briefly with he and Mary Beth in an attempt to support Mark in his marital struggles. Dean says, I once saw Mary Beth slap Mark's face so many times and so hard that he was bleeding from the corners of his mouth. I don't know why he took it from her. He didn't have to. He was a big guy about six foot two. Not that Mary Beth's a shrinking violet. She is quite tall herself and cuts an imposing figure. Her voice is also deep, gravelly, and as one associate tells it, quite intimidating. Dean goes on to say, Mary Beth always said she was the alpha dog, the one in charge, and she does like to control people by bullying. According to Dean, Mark didn't often talk about his problems with Mary Beth. The police were responsive to the family's information and pleas. However, a pair of reenactments of the shooting, nearly a year apart using Mary Beth's gun and scope and under light conditions that approximated those on the night of the shooting, proved inconclusive. Like Mary Beth, the officer sighting through the scope reported seeing only a dark mass weaving from side to side. With their new information, a pair of RCMP officers, including Constable Hewitt, traveled to Pennsylvania during the winter of 2008 and interviewed dozens of people who they believed could cast some light on the case. Dean says, did they get an earful? They left here feeling quite differently about the case. In April of 2008, on the basis of their findings, the Mounties finally filed charges against Mary Beth Harshberger, but not of first degree murder or even manslaughter as, the, as Mark's family and friends might have hoped but careless use of a firearm and criminal negligence causing death with the use of a firearm. The latter carries a maximum penalty of life in prison and is an extraditable offence. The authorities didn't believe they had enough evidence for a conviction of first degree murder, but they did believe they could get her for the lesser charge. She was certainly negligent and she did cause death. By the terms of Canada's extradition treaty with the US, the RCMP asked to have Mary Beth extradited to Newfoundland to stand trial. She was ordered to surrender on March 13 to the US authorities, who would in turn hand her over to the RCMP. Mary Beth finally went to trial in May of 2011 in Newfoundland and Labrador Supreme Court in Grand Falls, Windsor on account of criminal negligence. The case was heard without a jury in the courtroom of Justice Richard LeBlanc. During a reenactment that was used as evidence by the defence during trial, hunting guide Lambert Green and Reg White, the owner of the Moosehead Lodge where the Harshbargers stayed during their trip, said that what they saw through Harshbargers' rifle scope looked more animal than human. 
Police who conducted two reenactments said that all they could make out through Mary Beth's rifle scope was a black mass and it was plausible that she thought she was aiming at a bear. According to Dr. Nash Denick, the St. John's newfound pathologist who autopsied him, Mark Harshberger died of one gunshot wound to the abdomen. Dr. Denick revealed during Mary Beth's trial that Mark would most likely have been leaning over when he was struck by a bullet. The defence then explained that this bent, dark form could have easily been mistaken for a bear. The prosecution argued that Mary Beth knew her husband was in those woods and that it was possible he would be emerging from the site at any time, wearing dark clothing and that by her own admission it was really too dark to be hunting and that she shouldn't have taken the shot. But after all the evidence was in, Mary Beth was found not guilty of criminal negligence causing death in the shooting of her husband. Justice Richard LeBlanc concluded that the Crown had failed to prove that Mary Beth displayed a complete disregard for safety of others and that the death was a result of an accident and nothing more. The Harshbargers don't believe this was an accident, but the Crown has said that they won't appeal the October 1st ruling. Stating in an interview, the Crown can only appeal in Canada if the trial judge makes an error of law. It can't be on the basis of dispute over facts or a disagreement in the relation to the interpretation of facts. It must be on a question of law alone. It is said that Mary Beth left the court parking lot with a whoop of celebration and a blast of music in a white Mercedes driven by her defense attorney. I think she should be recharged for that display alone. How disrespectful to Mark's poor family. Who wants to know, speaking of family, what happened with Barry and Mary Beth? Well, Barry lived with Mary Beth and the kids until she left the home to stand trial in Canada in May 2011. At that time, Barry started a relationship with another woman who is now his wife. So then after the trial, on November the 1st in 2011, Barry obtained a temporary protection of abuse order against Mary Beth, citing that he was in fear of his life due to her unstable behavior and past violence. In the order... Barry wrote that Mary Beth had threatened him by pointing a loaded rifle at him at some point prior to October 18th in 2011. The court date was set for December 2nd in 2011 after a rescheduling by the judge. And the order of protection included Barry's father and siblings and their respective families. Barry was also seeking the return of 130 guns, which he stated were his and in Mary Beth's possession. After a contested hearing, the judge found that the evidence wasn't enough to keep the protective order in place, so it was dismissed. So that, my friends, is the case of Mark Harshberger. I'd like to know what you guys think. Did she really think it was a bear she was shooting at? Did she do it on purpose? Do you think she got away with murder? and not only get away with it but profit from it either way i feel so bad for mark's dad he lost not only mark but also barry because of that trip it just ripped his family apart he doesn't get to see his grandkids anymore it's just heartbreaking anyway like i said i'd love to hear your thoughts on this one let's continue the discussion over on social media Join us on Twitter at Love Trap Pod or Instagram at Surviving the Love Bomb. Trapped by Love is a Surviving the Love Bomb production. And if you'd like more information about recognizing abusive relationships, consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, Surviving the Love Bomb. You can also watch these podcasts on the Trap by Love YouTube channel. If you'd like to support either this podcast or my YouTube channel, you can do so over at paypal.com using the email survivingthelovebomb at gmail.com or at patreon.com slash survivingthelovebomb. I'm massively appreciative. I am so, so appreciative of any support that you're able to offer. I believe this topic is so important and it needs so much more exposure and your donations help me to be able to continue making content like this so thanks for joining me and until next time take care of yourselves and be kind to one another bye